Wow. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, this is the October OXOC talk. Um, I hope uh, you guys have all been warmer. It's, the weather's definitely improved. We've got uh, jo Professor John Parkington as our guest speaker this evening, and Stephen Vessels has joined us uh, to guide us through the virtual tours that were made available um, a few weeks ago. Um, a, a virtual tours of the Sevilla Rock Art Trail um, in the Pacais area of the Cedarburg, and the Viramook tour, which is closer to Clan William. Uh, so we're going to give you a little um, tour of the Sevilla tour and Viramook tour, and we'll try and integrate that with John's talk. Uh, John's uh, talk is all about carosses uh, in the rock paintings of the Western Cape. Um, and he's been working with Annie Patterson, who's also a member of the ECRAG rock art group um, that I'm a member of, um, and uh, with Jeanette Deacon. So um, the first thing we're going to do is, is fly through a little bit of the Sevilla area. So Stephen, if you'd like to sort of guide people through the, um, the drone footage uh, of the tour, we can have a look at some of the, um, the landmarks that uh, will be um, mentioned in John's talk in a, in a little bit. Um, and I hope you can all bear with us for a little bit. We've just trying to move the presentation over to, to my PC. And I'll then share John's, uh, uh, John's presentation through, through my video stream. So what Stephen is showing us there is the uh, Sevilla area. Um, he's looking west and then north. Um, it's moving around. This is a, a drone shot that uh, I think there are two drone shots taken at that farm. And this is all compiled in a software program called 3D Pano. And uh, you are then able to navigate and zoom in and out of the landscape. And you're actually hovering over site one of the Sevilla tour at this point. Um, he's now zooming in a little bit across the valley uh, towards the uh, east, which is towards Bushman's Cliff. Um, this is the other pano, I think. Yes, so this is the other pano uh, taken from the drone, uh, which is a little bit further east. And he's looking down on site three and site uh, four uh, at Sevilla. Um, now, John's talk, if uh, Steve, if you could move a bit west, um, so to, if you could sort of turn around. <laughs> um, he's going to talk about a site which is closer to, uh, closer to the cottages at Sevilla. Uh, we're not going to tell you exactly where it is. Um, it's not part of the part of the trail, but it's in that general vicinity that you're looking at now. Um, and uh, it's uh, slightly across the valley. And there, there are lots of rock art sites um, at Sevilla, and I think we've recorded over 60 sites with rock paintings in the general area around Sevilla. Um, one of the advantages of the virtual rock art tour format is that there are things you can do that you can't do in person on the trail. So we can add additional audiovisual aids to improve the educational experience of these tours. And so it's quite a new field for all of us um, to be quite creative and to use the technology, which has really caught up with this format um, in recent years. I think the earlier iterations of these uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s uh, were quite promising, but the um, you know, the data of running these things over the internet wasn't anywhere near where it has reached today. So Steve, if you could sort of clock a little bit left, um, further west, um, yes, if you keep going and then just maybe another 30 degrees, we'll just leave it hanging over there. And then I'm going to try, perfect, and then I'm going to try and pull in John's presentation, um, which has hopefully reached me. Um, Let's just see if that's arrived in my inbox. Okay, one second. Okay. Uh, John is the, is an emeritus professor in the Department of Archaeology at UCT. 
Um, he did both his undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in Paleolithic archaeology at Cambridge University in England. He's no stranger to the Arxoc Talks in the Western Cape. Um, and with an honours degree in 1966, he came to UCT as a junior lecturer and returned during his first university uh, sabbatical year in 1974 to complete the three terms residence requirement for his PhD. His PhD was awarded in 1977, since which time he has been ad hominem promoted to lecturer, sen senior lecturer, associate professor and full professor. John's research is directed at understanding long-term hunter-gatherer settlement in the Fainbos biome of the Western Cape involves mapping, sampling, and sometimes excavation of sites across the landscape, and analysis of the various kinds of materials recovered. The primary goal is to understand patterns of cultural variation and evolution through time. This is achieved by reconstructing life histories and social relations, settlement choices, image making, and resource use through the later Pleistocene and Holocene. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to share his presentation. Uh, let's pop that up. Okay, and I'm going to add All right, so hopefully this comes through. Okay. All right, and I think that should do it. Okay. Um, so John, let me just uh, See if I can um, control the, the stream while we have your presentation up. Um, yes, it's coming through. And uh, you can fire away. It's on your first slide. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Nick. Thanks for this um, invita invitation. Um, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. <laughs> Uh, can, first of all, can people hear me? Nick, yep. I thought you'll have to answer that. Perfectly. Secondly, can they see me? Yes, we can all see you. Okay. And can I see my presentation? I don't need to see me or you or Stephen. Uh, so can I see my presentation as a full screen? Is that possible? Yeah, if you if you open up your presentation on your end um, and then just move through it, I'll I'll keep following. If you just say next page or something like that, because I'm I've currently got it open on my screen. I'm controlling oh. yours. Um, yeah, I don't know where it is now. Oh, uh, let me have a look. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so people can see me, people can see that screen, and I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I, I, what I thought I would do, and I've done this recently a couple of times, is do my thanking and my acknowledgements right at the beginning because, you know, towards the end, sometimes one gets a bit lost. So I want to thank the people down there in the bottom right. Um, I first went up into that part of the world with, with Tim and Haim and Ginger and Percy. So I want to thank them for introducing me to a lot of these sites, D'Artagnan and the Three Musketeers. I want to thank Royden and Tony for a lot of companionship and, and, and help and uh, uh, hard work while we were, while we were sorry. I want to thank Jeanette and Megan for lots of inspiring thoughts. I want to thank Jose and Matthias Gunter. I want to thank Nick, Heinz Ruter and Stephen, Pippa, my wife Sandy, and, as always, Cedric. Could this be a leopard? Okay, I want to... Um, uh, the, the image on the top left there, do you think this might be a leopard? Um, it's been enhanced by Andy. At the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you to vote on that. So I'll come back to it. But is it a leopard? That's what it looks like on the top right. Uh, and that's what the enhanced image looks like. But the point, the point here is how do we know what things are in the paintings? How do we identify content? 
And how do we then move from identifying content to approaching the issue of meaning and the question as to why people uh, in the past chose to, to paint that content? Um, and in particular, and I, I, I want to say that Andy uh, and I uh, are writing about this. Uh, he, he didn't necessarily agree with everything I'm going to say, um, but but we, we are doing this together and we're in, in substantial agreement on these things. This issue, uh, and, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on cloaks uh, or carosses. The word cloak, you could just replace with caross if you prefer that word. And many of you may know the site of Procession Shelter where there's a whole line of, uh, of human figures uh, wearing cloaks, as we would say. Uh, that's, um, that's here. This issue of identifying material started in the 1980s when Royden and Tony and I uh, were uh, looking at images in, in this absolute region around um, Sevilla, uh, Bushman's Group, and identifying nets. We were finding um, images that looked to us like nets. We thought they were little antelope being chased towards them and so forth. Uh, we published a paper on that in 1985. There's quite a bit of argument about that, uh, and many people felt that they weren't nets. Um, I'll, 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 I'll just explain how we, why we felt that later and... Um, I'm going to argue, really, that this is not a trivial question. It's not an easy question to answer. What is something? And how would we know that it is? Okay? And in particular, obviously, I'm going to concentrate on the cloaks. Um, are they cloaks? How would we know that they were cloaks? And if they are cloaks, what does that mean? So it, it, it's a debate that's rooted in the 1980s. I'm going to... We, 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 we're going to use um, uh, Gombrich's Art and Illusion and Panofsky's Studies in Iconology as a kind of inspire, inspiring framework for this. In the 1980s, the, the notion of gaze and guess came up. Um, the, the, the idea was that in the past, People looking at rock art had looked at it, gazed, and guessed what, what, it, what it means, and guessed what the imagery was, uh, and played a kind of ethnographic snap. And shamanism was presented as a kind of solution to this. Well, it isn't a solution, of course. Uh, it's just a different kind of gazing and a different kind of guessing, as, as I will try and argue. Gombrich argues that in any painting tradition, the painters... And the, and the viewers are engaged in the kind of co-creation of a series of schemata. You can't paint nature. It's too complicated. It's too detailed. So painters don't paint nature. They, they paint schema, uh, which simplify uh, and conventionalize images. And they can only do that if they're in this kind of co-creation mode with their viewers. So within the technology that they have and the techniques that they have um, and within the ontological framework of how they're seeing the world, they develop schemata to, to make their points. And it's a kind of back and forth uh, mechanism where they, they're, they're guessing, they're trying something out, trying a version of how to simplify a particular image, a particular object or a particular landscape or whatever it is they're doing and then they there's a form of kind of correction and eventually um, they arrive at a set of schemata which serve their purpose allow the communication if you like between the artists and the viewers it's very popperian that's not really surprising because those both these two blokes you know panofsky and gombrick were born in the very late uh, 19th very early 20th century they operated in Vienna and, and Eastern Europe uh, they, they were they were contemporaries of Popper um, more or less and um, it's not surprising that they were very much influenced by him but the subject matter then is um, is this image this is Royden's tracing 
of an image uh, at Savella. And at the time uh, that we first looked at it in the in the early to mid eighties, we 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 thought it was it was amazingly detailed and amazingly specific, and it's so apparently readable that we thought we could look at it and we could understand some of those schemata, if you like, some of the some of the meanings that the painters had intended. So, for instance, the, these these two lines of human figures. Uh, the lower line there, uh, everybody seems to be naked. There are a few penises, not very many, but three or four or five. Um, uh, no breasts, right? In the upper line, there, there, uh, at the back of the upper line is a long line of what we would call and what we did call and what I believe everybody calls actually cloaked figures, figures wearing cloaks. And then a line, and then at the front of the line, and somewhat differentiated from the cloak figures, uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight apparently naked figures beginning to crouch, clearly distinguished from everybody further back. And they're crouching underneath a series of kind of ghost shapes, which are these tapering shapes, which we take to be bags, which we take to be hunting bags, in fact, and a possible bow there. Um, there's a uh, there's a there's a figure behind the last figure of the lower line. I don't know if you chaps can see my um, my my arrow, but I'm, I'm pointing at it now. This shape we take to be a um, an eland torso, and it's always interested in me because it's so close. To the back figure in that lower line, that it almost looks as if there isn't space there for the white neck and face of the eland to go in there without uh, without impinging on the legs of that figure. I'm not sure about that. So the reason I'm mentioning this, and Andy is very keen on this idea, and I, I think he might be right, uh, that this may never have been an eland, but it may always have been an eland torso. In other words, we can't be sure that the neck and face or the lower legs uh, were ever painted there. And then there are some blobby shapes towards the bottom, which we conventionally call palettes. I'm not going to talk too much about those. It seems like a very coherent um, uh, image that's been very carefully constructed. Um, and it looks eminently readable. It obviously has something to do with wearing clothes, and in particular cloaks, versus not wearing clothes. It has something to do with those um, tapering shapes. It has something to do with the, the kinds of equipment that are in those figures on the top line versus the kind of equipment and other details in the bottom line. Right? Now, and there are, there are, there are some um, close-ups of some of the naked figures. There's a penis, one of the penises. Here's some of the cloaked figures in the middle part uh, of the upper line. Uh, there's quite a lot of differentiation between figures. It doesn't look like a, a single figure repeated. It looks like these are individuals. And they've got bags on their back and they've got hunting bags over their shoulder and they've got possibly bows uh, there. But you can see that already I'm reaching to interpret these 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 aspects of the content you know and that's that's exactly what Gombrich uh, is talking about how do we and, and Panofsky how do we recognize a bit of a bit of content especially in light of the fact that men in the Kalahari don't uh, wander around with no clothes on um, and they and they certainly when they're wearing what we might call a cloak or a cross they, the, the cloaks or crosses never look as organized as these shapes that you can see on these figures in the in the upper center there. You can also see, by the way, in the bottom right there, that the naked figures at the front of these lines are touching one another. They're holding one another. Every one of them has got their hands out in front of them, touching the person in front. And all of these, I think, are meaningful details. Of course, we don't know um, a priori you know, what details are meaningful and, and what are not. That's up to us. 
there's, and that's, that's the point here, I suppose. This is not a photograph. And there's no, and the only way we can agree what these things are is consensus. We can't make a guess and then send it to Jeanette or, or Nick uh, or David Lewis Williams and say, I think this is a such and such, am I right? We can't do that. There is no authority on this. That's something that David was struggling with in the early 80s when he wanted to impose his own authority on the way rock art interpretation should go. And obviously, to some extent, he's right. We should not be, we should be, we should be trying to make our interpretation of these paintings cons consistent with the San literature, the San ethnographies and so on. We are allowed a few surprises. Um, but it's all about it's all about negotiating meaning with our fellow uh, rock art researchers. Are these men? Well, some of them definitely are. Uh, none of them are definitely women. I think we can say that. Um, in the year two thousand, uh, Judy Stevenson wrote an article criticizing Royden and Tony and I's interpretation of this image and saying that we were calling them men because we were androcentric, we were just not able to see women, and pointing out quite rightly that if a figure is wearing a cloak, you can't see breasts or penis. So, you, you know, in that top line, for instance, certainly uh, most of the figures towards the back end, you, you, you can't say whether they're men or women by penises or breasts. Um, the argument we're going to make today is that we, 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 didn't, we didn't just assume they were men. Perhaps we weren't as clear as we should have been in the 80s about why we thought these were men. I, th I think we were, actually, but uh, I, I'm prepared to accept that perhaps it wasn't clear enough. And it's really that case that I'm going to try and make now. Um, and, and, and what we're going to try and do is find these schemata, these conventionalized shapes that artists and their viewers generated together by a process of co-creation uh, and by, by, by trial and error, if you like, um, so that the, the artist painting and the viewer viewing were on the same page, as it were, and would be understanding what things were when as Gombrich says, they're not photographs. They, don't, they, they, they sometimes look like the things that they are the schema of, but sometimes, as I'll explain, they're not that similar. Um, and and, and, and you, you have to go a bit further than that. Now, we all know, uh, by the way, I'm showing you lots of uh, slides of images which many of you will have seen, so... I'm sure you'll have lots of questions about that. There are some very revealing images of men and women in, in the rock art of the Western Cape. And these are really, really important. These are from Driuk, and many of you will have seen these. There are a couple of lines of figures at Driuk that are really interesting. The one on the right, for instance, lots of clues here. Uh, two penises here. Uh, these are men. Okay, the two in the middle. The two, the one at the front and the one at the back, uh, in my view, women. This one may have breasts, but you see, again, I'm saying, what is the content here? Are those breasts? You might disagree. If you disagree, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I can't say to Jeanette, you know, you decide. Lewis Williams, you know, tell us what this really is. It's all about consensus. These two women are both carrying very interesting objects, which I take to be arrows. They're forked at the top in both cases. These two men are not carrying those. These two men have those tapering bags over their shoulder. And very interestingly, and I'm not going to go into this now, but I think it's extremely important, and we have been writing about this elsewhere, uh, they're carrying two little sticks in one hand. And if you look down at the bottom left, in a, in a line that's just above this, uh, there's another man there, um, He's got one stick in one hand, and he's got two little sticks there. These two little sticks are very important. I don't know what they are. 
and we're working towards trying to understand that. We have got them in various places, and I think we'll be able to work it out. So you can see what we're trying to do here is a process of extrapolation um, from overt uh, sexual uh, indications to what, what goes with it. These men do not have bangles around their knees. Um, um, and they do not carry arrows in that very odd way. Um, they, they, they have other things. So that the associations uh, of, the, of the male and the female figures are quite interesting, and we can build it up from there. So now, here's a cloaked man on the left uh, and a naked male figure on the right. Um, there's the penis on the right. This, this is on the Sevilla Trail. And you can just see a foot over here on the right-hand side there. And you can see a, a fainter figure here, another penis there. And this is the main figure. These are three very, very similar figures. They're carrying bows. Now, these, these people are carrying bows and arrows in a meaningful way. This, th th these are users. That woman in the past slide was not a user of arrows in that sense or a bow. She's not carrying a bow. This man's carrying a bow. And he's got over his shoulder one of those tapering shapes. And probably originally, although it's not terribly clear now, there were arrows and other equipment sticking out of the square end of the, of the tapering shape that's over his shoulder. And on the left-hand side from Varenhoek, you can see here's a naked, uh, sorry, a cloaked figure. Uh, he's got a bag on his back, but he's also got that tapering shape over his shoulder and very and he's wearing a cloak but really interestingly the bottom end of the tapering bag is sticking out over here he the painter here has deliberately not painted it across the cloak and that's very very common uh, so somehow the, the, the painter has but you see the equipment there's the bow there's the bowstring the various kinds of things sticking out of his bag there and they're always uh, they're always up there behind the head, um, and, and there's the bottom end. And, of course, what, what comes out here is, okay, well, it's, it simply is he's carrying it on the other side. If this uh, figure is moving towards the right, he's, he's carrying it over his left shoulder, right? Uh, this guy's carrying it over his right shoulder. It's, it's, it's more difficult to show here that that tapering bag is not intruding, um, but there isn't a cloak anyway. But I, I think you could make the case that it's also around, around the back. Now, these tapering bags we have, Tim, Tim first wrote a paper about these kinds of uh, scenes. We, 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 we call them group scenes. I think Tim called them group scenes, and we just took that up. These are sets of, there's a whole lot of it. We, I think we've got 20 or 30 of these images now. They're not restricted to the Western Cape, as Tim might have thought there in the, uh, in the, in the 60s, uh, although they may be a bit different when you find them in Lesotho or in, in the Drakensberg. But there are lots of them in the Western Cape. They are people, often hook-headed people, sometimes what we started to call TV hook-headed people, sitting down, sometimes facing the viewer, in the case of the TV hook-heads, these chaps, sometimes facing sideways, sometimes with a, with a single standing figure, and sometimes Royden and Martin Hall and Joe Golson wrote about this in the early 80s, thinking that maybe those standing figures were actually dancers, but above them, there are these bags hanging up. Sometimes the pegs on which the bags are hanging are depicted. Sometimes they're not. Um, uh, but but there, there are often different kinds of bags. There are these round bags, always with lots of tassels. Here are some little, almost kind of handbag, you know, small bags hanging from a stick, perhaps. But always there are these tapering shapes. And it's the tapering shapes, the, the tapering shapes that have the bows and the arrows associated with them. So we can be pretty sure here are some lovely arrows coming out here. Here are some, I presume, arrows coming out here. So we can be pretty sure that that tapering bag is, is associated with bows and arrows, right? It's associated with male equipment. 
And if we broaden this to look at some more cloaked figures, look at this keyhole kind of shape. It's very, very common. We used to call them miniskirts. They have these lovely legs coming out, you know, and these square miniskirt bottoms, and then these rounded shoulders, uh, and then the bags on the back. But again, the bags are not intruding on this shape. There's the bag. It's not intruding. Uh, this this is desecration shelter just on the Paco's Pass. Lovely bag, square-ended, probably the rounded end on the other side. It's not going across. It's not going across this shape. They are, I would say, they're protecting this shape, right? Hookhead, facing right, stuff coming out of the bag, uh, probably also facing right, hook-headed figures, bags on the back. Sometimes... Not, the cloaks are not always a different colour to the legs and so on, but, but very often they are. Uh, Geoflacter, this is a fantastic, I mean, a lot of you know this um, image. Wonderful painting which has a finger drawn set of human figures on the top, or, although there's a single female figure above that, and then a fine line group down below. Absolutely amazing juxtaposition. These people, who I presume were later, who painted this line, were certainly making some kind of comment about the fine line. But if you look at the fine line, look at it. They're the same kind of round-shouldered. Now, nobody, you can't get a photograph of a, of a person in the Kalahari wearing anything like this. It is not natural. It is not real. It is a scheme in, uh, in Grombrich's sense. And here are the bags of various kinds on the back. Here's a naked male figure uh, and a, and a female figure. So this is this is a this is a this has a different meaning overall to the to the Sevilla um, Royden's tracing of that Sevilla thing, which I started out with. But nevertheless, components of it may be similar. In other words, these cloaked figures uh, may be may be similar. But look at these here. Look at these two little. Uh, tass these two little bits of paint coming down here. Now that's, it's not uh, universal, but it's very common to find these things. And that means that we have to start to think um, what, what this cloak is and what it's made of. Well, it's likely to be skin, of course. Um, and so um, uh, I'll come back to what those things are. Uh, and, and you can see, actually, that there's a lot of detail on many of these images that I'm just not dealing with at the moment. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's not important. Uh, I just think that what we have to do is to find bits we can deal with and, and, and see how we can deal with them. Now, obviously, these cloaks are likely to be the skins of, of, of large animals. Now, there are a huge set of implications for that. First of all, someone's got to kill that animal. Well, they don't have to. I guess, I guess they could find a dead animal. But usually that animal will be killed and skinned. The, 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 the skin will be taken off the animal and put onto the hunter or put onto the hunter's wife. But you don't get one for free. So there are a lot of implications, really, in being able to access what we might call, call the torso. Traditionally, we will call this the torso um, of the eland. And look, in the case of this eland, there's a red line along the nape and down the forehead there, and the, the, the face and the neck is in white, and the legs are in white. Now there's an eland, and you can see that this is not a photograph of an eland. It, it does look enough like an eland so that you might be able to distinguish from a hartebeest or whatever, but it's not a photograph of an eland. It's been reduced been conventionalized, been simplified, it's become a schema, it's become something that viewer and painter can agree on. Again, this is uh, Royden's tracing of that. But the point is that this is not only a torso. When, when you skin the animal, um, that's the hide, that's the bit that you take off. Uh, most people who skin an animal don't come all the way up the neck and the face and try and take that skin off. They don't. And they don't come down the bottom of the legs. They stop uh, somewhere uh, at the top of the thighs uh, of the front and the back legs. And um, th that's, in a sense, what I'm suggesting that these are. And we, we keep seeing them, and we'll see some more of them later on. 
So, um, the, you know, what, what I'm going to argue is that the cloak is the torso, um, but I'm actually going to argue that the cloak and the, and the torso are both uh, what's being painted in the cloak. It's, it, it, it's that the, the torso doesn't really look like the torso of an eland, and the cloak doesn't really look like the cloak of a man in the Kalahari. So whenever you go to nature, to the eland or to the Kalahari, you get something that's much more complicated. Uh, and the answer to, to what these things are has to do with the connectivity between them, the relationship between them, if you like. So if we were to turn that eland through 90 degrees, we've got a hook head, eh? We've got a hook-headed figure uh, with a cloak, only it's a torso, and with a neck and face painted in another color and a red line around it. Uh, obviously, the legs are not in the right place, but, uh, but uh, you can get the point. So is this a hook-headed eland, or is it a future cloak? The answer is I think it's both. The, the point about San ways of thinking about the world is that objects never stop being the raw materials that they're made out of. So a little bag never stops being a steambox from which it's made. The cloak never stops being an eland from which it was made. The arrows never stop being reeds from which they were made. And you can see that all the way through uh, the references to these objects in the Blake and Lloyd records. Now this convention for, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's most obvious perhaps in the bike. These are very typical bichrome eland from the Western Cape. Um, but of course you get more complicated eland, such as the ones from Zimri, or, or in the Eastern Cape, some of the, the ones from the Thomas River. But they're actually still drawn in pretty well the same way. These are much more elaborate eland, but still the, the, the part that is the hide is, is, is differentiated from the part that's the neck and the face or the lower legs. And that is true. Um, I, I don't know whether what I'm saying about the Western Cape uh, applies in the Eastern Cape or the Drakensberg. Uh, obviously, I can't even be sure that it applies in the Western Cape. And you may disagree with me, and that's fine. But I'm, I'm really focusing on the animals in the Western Cape. So here, this is Creator Cranston. Here again, you see for the torso this rounded shoulder, which is not like the photograph of the eland. There's the white neck and face coming off. Of course, some of the little red up there, you can see that little bit of red there or there. This is the, this is the part of the eland, the little red hank of hair where the mantis sits in order to protect the eland from the hunter. So these are all meaningful details, even though they might be very small and on some animals they, they might be hard to see. And again, they can be yellow, orangey, or they can be red. Uh, at Creda Kranz, I mean, I, I, I'm deviating from my line here a bit, but this is another of Royden's tracing. Look at these men. Uh, yes, they've got cloaks, beautiful legs as well. Um, uh, here's, here's a single man with the kind of keel shape. Now, again, very unreal very conventionalized. This is the schema. It means something to the painter and the viewer as part of that communication. These guys are all, got their carosses if, or cloaks, if you like, have been joined together. Personally, I believe this is a way that uh, this is a, a, an extension of the cloak idea where the, the, the artist has tried to convey the notion of uh, the cloak collective, if you like. And I think it's related to the, the fact that those young men are touching one another. They are joining the brotherhood of cloaks, okay? A um, few more examples. Here's a figure. Even, you know, here's, here's what we used to call a caross absent figure. We don't know whether the cloak or caross was ever painted. In some cases it may have been, in some cases it may not have been. But here are the bags again and other equipment appearing either side of the cloak. There is a distinct attempt by painters not to interrupt that torso equals cloak shape. I, I, and I, I, I can only think because it's important and because it's actually the relationship between cloak and torso that's, that's important. Here's a line of naked men, 
um, at Sevilla, not far away from our original line. This is a penis here, by the way, not a foot. So this is not a very a man with very short legs. Uh, this is a bottom. This is a penis, and his legs are down here. You can just see legs. So it's a line of men, very different men. But again, look at them. They they're carrying bags, but they're carrying uh, uh, they they're carrying uh, tapering bags across the shoulder with equipment sticking out, and it's net it, it, it it's not weighted digging sticks sticking out. It's arrows and bows. Uh, this guy's carrying his bow. This guy's got his bow here. Um, this is something else sticking out. So we could go on and on with images where we get straight topped tapering bags with arrows and bows sticking out, uh, knapsack bags, straight topped hunting bags going across and appearing on the other side but with the arrows and the bows sticking out. There's a more rounded bag. So what I'm trying to argue here is that there are these associations between um, clearly male um, hunting equipment, the cloaks, and where you can see them, uh, male primary or, uh, sexual characteristics. So to get back to our original point about how we recognize things, I think a bow is a bow because it looks like one. I don't think it's a bow because we know that people in the Kalahari have bows. Yes, that's true. But people in the Kalahari also have bags. And when we point to the bow, uh, you know, um, the, this is the bow. It's not a bag. So um, David Lewis Williams' argument that something should be registered in the ethnography before we can try and find it in the paintings is partly true. It's, it's, um, it, it's a valuable pointer, but in fact, the key is what it looks like. And I think that this is where, you know, what, what, um, what Gombrich and Panofsky are saying is really helpful to us and gives us, gives us the way forward. But a cloak, interestingly, is a cloak, not because it looks like one, and you may think I'm having it both ways here, but because of the conceptual relationship, the meaningful relationship the relationship that would have been obvious to all the viewers and the painter, him or herself, um, between the, 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 as I say here, the, the hide of the eland and the leather garment that is obtained by the hunter, prepared by the hunter and worn by both himself and his wife. His wife is not going to get a large eland skin. Well, I guess she shouldn't uh, unless he gives it to her, right? And it, so in both cases, what, we, what, what the viewer would have been able to do is to read gender associations, behavioral correlates, and ontological context, that is, ways of seeing the world uh, into all of these painted images. And the test of the image is not simply its lifelikeness, but its efficacy within a context of action. In other words, in the, in the social uh, circumstances inhabited by the painter and the viewer. It may be lifelike, like the bow, if that's thought to contribute to its potency, but in other contexts, the nearest schema will suffice, providing that it retains the efficacious nature of the prototype. This is a fantastic painting over here from Bushmills Clue. Many of you will have seen it. It's at, uh, and I, I'm absolutely certain I will have seen this painting for the first time with Tim Maggs, Heim Rabinovitz, Percy Seif, and Ginger Townley Johnson. It's at Sonia, what's called Sonia's Upper. After only being in South Africa for a month, they took me up there and we slept in these caves. But look at what's happened here. It's a line, it, first of all, it seems to have some perspective in it as these rather similar figures uh, appear to be um, decreasing in size into the distance. And they've got their bows, but the, again, the bow, the, no bow goes across where we presume the cloak or the Karas was. This, this is a rule. I, I, I'm I not saying uh, you'll never find that, but I would be interested to see paintings where that rule is broken. So, Gombrich says, a representation is never a replica. 
The forms of art, ancient and modern, are not duplications of what the artist has in mind any more than they are duplications of what he sees in the outer world. In both cases, they are renderings within an, within an acquired medium, a medium grown up through tradition and skill, and this is a crucial bit, the tradition and skill of both the artist and the beholder. And we can go on from that and we can say, well, what else are they doing with these cloaks? Um, these are elephant-headed men wearing cloaks. So something of that cloak notion is coming into this, but it's being merged with other things, right? Another avoidance tracing. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting painting. A cloaked figure, if that's a breast, and I'm prepared to accept that it is, but again, we're only going to get there by consensus because we don't know. That could be a female figure wearing a cloak. There is a bag with tassels, but there's no shoulder bag. There's no tapering shape across the shoulder. So I'd be interested to see what you think about this. Um, and also, to, uh, you may know of lots of other uh, clearly female figures wearing cloaks. I'd be interested to see them and to think about them. Because, of course, we do have a lot of female figures, uh, often uh, figures in lines, like these two lines, um, distinguishable, I would say, uh, in many ways from males. And so we, ca we can begin, begin to see some more schema there. Um, here's a really nice, we call this Mrs. Berg's site because Margaret Berg first showed the site to us. And it's, it's interesting because it's got males and figures in, male and female figures in the same line. And look at these two on the left. Very, very clearly, male and female figures are painted in different ways. With a male figure, you want nice shoulders, um, and so you can put the upper part of the body facing to the viewer. On the female figure, she has to face to the right because you want to show the breasts, and there they are. So in terms of waist, in terms of buttocks, in terms of legs, and in various ways, we get clues about what, about, about how, how the, how the artist was communicating to his or her audience about male and female figures. Then, of course, we've got these things from Kriegerkrantz. And I don't know where to go here, but my the way I'm thinking is these are cloak-like shapes, but I think I'd be inclined to call them shrouds rather than cloaks. There are no legs coming out. So this is, this is an elaboration, I think, on the cloak idea. Uh, and, you know, of course, the cloaked figures at Zimri. Look at these two cloaked figures down there. Here are those, those um, shapes coming out of the bottom corners of the cloak. But these cloaks are cross-hatched. And, and there are lots of other amazing details on these which, um, you know, which need to be uh, thought about. You know. So here we are, back to where we started. Um, I, there's a long way to go. I, I, I think we have an understanding of that image uh, at Sevilla. I think we can take it into other images and we can start to think about what those might mean. I think you can gaze and guess, but you've got to be careful. And I think everybody actually does gaze and guess. Um, and I think ethnographic snap is another much more complicated issue. It is useful to have uh, the Kalahari ethnography and the Blake and Lloyd archive uh, by our side to make our interpretations. But we all know, we all know, and there's no way around this, that they are both inspiration and trap. And so we shouldn't be derisive about gazing and guessing, and we shouldn't be derisive about ethnographic snap. We should try and deal with those things uh, carefully. So Andy very kindly enhanced this image, and uh, um, could this be a leopard? I mean, it kind of epitomizes my whole point. Is it a leopard? I, if this were a TV game, I would ask all of you, I don't know how many of you are, there are out there, to say yes or no. I'd, it, send me the answer, or send it to Nick, or whatever. But I'd like, to, I, I just saw this shape here, of the back, and I thought leopard. But clearly, I'm, I might be being influenced by the spotted nature of the residual paint. 
I, I, I'm not even, I haven't done enough analysis. I'm not even sure whether these little black spots are actually paint or whether they are paint that's been colonized by lichen. Clearly, this is a complicated surface here, and we'll have to think about that. But um, it, it kind of epitomizes the point. Um, how do we look at something and know what it is? And once we know what it is, or think we know what it is, how do we move on from that and say what it might mean or have meant to the painter? So, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Yes, uh, thank thank you, th thanks, John. If you have listened, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to make questions. I'm happy to ask questions. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, I'm just going to update the uh, the stream, and I'll pop the. Uh, virtual to back on um, and Stephen if you could um, pop your virtual tour back on uh, and you can kind of go if you could go to the Baramook tour actually it'd be kind of nice to see procession shelter that's got some very nice um, joke figures in oh, there as an example uh, so Stephen's going to yeah he's zooming in on to, to Baramook um, so I'm going to also have a look at the um, questions. So if you guys could pop your questions in the chat. I think there's 60 people uh, who are attending the talk at the moment. Um, but while we wait for some questions, um, John, I, yeah, I really like the, the, the chased image that you showed with all the figures clustered together, you know, in that kind of uh, multi- yeah, um, you know, one cloak covering all those figures. Um, yeah, because yeah, if you look closely at those legs, um, they I was trying to count whether they match, you know, <laughs> the, an even number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but even if if you take that away, um, there seems to be a disregard at some point for worrying too much whether it's it's you know oriented the right way or realistically. Um, so it seems like you know it's just legs and it's, and it's this weird you know cloaked area and it's it's a it's a very interesting yeah. um, there are actually motif. two of those there at Kirbos. Mm. There are two images like that right next to one another, and one of them has been repainted. So if you look at the, it's not the one that Roy that I had Royden was tracing up there, but the other one. You if you look inside the cloak, the the joint cloak, you can see legs. So clearly it was originally. A bunch of shorter chaps and then somebody came along and extended the cloaks down across the legs and painted some more legs so uh yeah i i i, I really think that you see i i, I yeah I, let's hear what other people think yeah. yeah. Um, so Mary Edwards has got a question uh, she asked have you seen other paintings of leopards in caves uh, or shelters. Um, uh, I, I've definitely seen a few. Um, you've, I'm sure you've seen some. Have I seen what? Uh, paintings of leopards. Well, this is really interesting because, thank you, Mary. I mean, <laughs> I've just been up uh, to uh, the Over the Paco's area, and Tracy Duplessis there told me that she wanted to show me a leopard, a painting of a leopard. So we went to see it, but before we got there, I saw this image. And I, so there I am standing in front of this painting thinking it was a leopard. And then we went to see traces, and I didn't think traces was a leopard, although I think it might be a feline or it could be a, a carnivore, but I'm, I'm not sure it's a leopard. So I have seen leopards and, interestingly, um, cheetahs at Kakakama. Uh, they, I, uh, and and I, it was exactly the same incident there. They, the people at Kakakama said, we've got a cheetah, painting of a cheetah. And I said, well, I'm skeptical because I've never seen one. Uh, we went there and that's what it looks like. It's got a very small head. It's very rangy. And I think it's a cheetah. And next to it was what I think was a leopard. So the answer is, I think they're very rare, but that's why I wanted Tracy to, to take us to it. Um, and even when I saw this one, which Nico, you've met Nico, Nick, uh, the farmer mm -hmm. there, he, he took us and uh, he, he, he didn't think it was, uh, nobody actually other than me so far thinks it's a leopard. So I'm very interested to see what people think. But that's what it looked like. 
But no, Mary, they, they, they are very rare in the Western Cape. There is a kurbos, a, I would say a clear feline. It's got a very long curved tail, but it's very odd at the front end. And uh, the back end uh, looks like a feline, yes, of some kind. But the front end is very complicated. It might not even be simply this species or that species. Mm. Yeah, they are quite an odd odd one, yeah. There's certainly so few of them, and when they have been painted, they they aren't as clear and specific. There is one, I think there's a something that looks like a lion at Leuflach, if I if I if I recall that correctly. But um sure. yeah, it's yeah, okay. they're incredibly rare. Um yeah. so yes, we have some other and um, so Steve's got a nice shot there of, of procession shelter. He's, so he was flipping through various images of de-stretched um images of the of the cloaked figures in in the shelter. Um, and that should be more familiar to Yvonne, so a walking ground. Um, so we've also got one from Stella Hill. Um, evening, Stella. Uh, so she says, how do you know that the man killed the eland and then made it into a cloak for him and his wife? How do you know that? This is, this is our uh, ambiguous relationship with the ethnography. It, it, in, in the Kalahari ethnography, women do not go out and kill Elan. Uh, and, 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 and clearly female figures um, in the paintings do not uh, wield in any kind of realistic way bows and arrows. They, uh, the, the, those two women holding the arrow, that's telling us something extremely important about women and arrows. But it's not telling us that women go out with the bow and arrow and shoot things. And in the Kalahari, they don't. So in, if, if we take the Kalahari, the ethnographic snap, if you like, if we take, if we're brave enough to do that, which we have to be, quite frankly, um, then we would say it's very unlikely that a woman could provide herself with a large hide to make into a cloak. Now, when Judy Stevenson um, argued that we were wrong about those figures, being men and she said why couldn't they be women she also said that in the kalahari the cloak is more clearly associated with women than with men and and, and she was arguing that we were wrong when you go and look at those references that she gave there uh richard lee is indeed saying uh that that women wear cloaks or crosses more than men, but he's saying it in relation to people collecting and gathering. And women certainly use that cloak as a collecting device. But what I'm saying here is that it's, that it's a more complicated relationship between the cloak and the torso, which has to do with who's providing it, who's making it, who is responsible for... Um, uh, turning, if you like, uh, the, the the skin of the animal in, into the cloak, and um, so so I, I suppose what I'm saying is, but the ethnography and the rock paintings are coherent on this. Look, um, what interestingly, what Judy Stevenson didn't do is put forward the hypothesis that they that those were female figures. She said they could be. She said, we can't tell because they're wearing cloaks. Now, we, obviously, that's true. But uh, when I was a uh, postgraduate student in Cambridge, David Clark said something to me once, which I've never forgotten, although I've struggled to find out where he got it from. He said, a beautiful hypothesis is never destroyed by an ugly fact, only by a more beautiful hypothesis. So if you don't like our hypothesis about that Sibylla painting, you can make your own. And our job is to distinguish between these hypotheses. I'm a good Popperian, like Panofsky and Gombrich, you know. If you want to, and I, I would say that to make the case that those figures are cloaked females, despite the, it's going to be much more difficult for you in terms of coherence and Occam's razor and all of those kind of logical uh, 
uh, networks of argumentation. It's going to be much more difficult. The simplest answer is that not only are the figures in the front of those lines male and naked, but the men at the back are male and clothed. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. Um, Steve, if you wouldn't mind um, flipping through to site three at Sevilla, that would actually be quite useful as well. Um, that's that's got some nice, nice examples of that uh, combination. Um, and we've got lots of questions. Gosh, um, so Rose Smuts has asked um, whether you know what uh, age the paintings are that have the cloaked figures. Rose, so thank when, you. Which, which period? Uh, Rose, I've still got your book, by the way. Don't worry, I'm looking after it. Rose, um, it, we, we don't know how old most of the paintings are. We have got a very, very small number of radiocarbon dates on, on painted images. Maybe in South Africa we've got 25 or 30 dates, uh, perhaps a few more. And we've got a million images. So you can see that we really don't know how old most of these images actually are. And we're more or less forced into a position of thinking of them as all more or less the same age. We do have a few examples where paintings are indirectly dated by, by their association with a fireplace, or in the case of Choppy's slab that fell off the wall uh, at Lambert's Bay, and is covered by occupation deposit, which is about three and a half thousand years old. Um, and then further north, uh, but still within the kind of sand painting area, we have little bits of painting that are dated by association back to 13,000 uh, bits of engravings or bits of uh, paintings. And then, of course, we've got the famous Apollo 11 paintings, which are not slabs off the wall of cave, but are slabs of paintings which are stratified in the deposit of Apollo 11 and which may be 25,000. So we, we can say that these paintings reflect a 25,000 year tradition. If you ask me, I would say that most of the paintings that we see are nowhere near 25,000 years old. Uh, but I have no proof of that. I would say we're probably looking at Holocene paintings by and large. We may be looking at paintings that are replacements of paintings that were previously there and have subsequently faded. Um, so, uh, and the other, at the other extreme, at the recent end, of course, we have paintings that are paintings of, of colonial subject matter, and they can't be older than about five or 600 years. We have paintings that are clearly paintings uh, of fat tail sheep and yeah, well let's just leave it at that fat tail sheep which can't be much more than about 2100 or so so we have some clues as to the age of some paintings but most of them unfortunately not and so very very interesting questions like did subject matter change through time you know we can't really answer um we have some we have some superpositioning of paintings. Um, in other words, sometimes we can be sure that one painting is later than another because it's on top of it, but we don't know uh, we don't know what the time interval between between the, the original painting and the later painting was. So so that you're quite right. You know, aging these things is a big problem. The young archaeologist coming through who dates paintings and can do it on a mass scale. Is going to be a real hero. Mm, definitely. <laughs> uh, thanks, John. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, so Maxine uh, Davies has asked, um, it has been so good to follow you around some familiar sites again. And she's just saying hello. It's a little shout out um, from the Friends of the SA Museum. And then Gail Strong and Mike Strong, um, all the arrows carried by the female figures appear curved, not straight as expected. Could they not be digging sticks? Well, I showed those. Uh, there aren't very many arrows carried by women. In fact, I'm not sure at the moment that I know any others other than those ones at Drehook. But in Drehook, they're carried in an outstretched palm arm uh, held in the middle 
by a female figure and the top end is forked and the bottom end is not. So again, following Gombrich's rule, life likeness is not the issue here. And I would ask all the people listening here to say what it would be the critical characteristic of an arrow um, that you would insist the painter painted in order for you to know it's an arrow. It's quite likely to be the knock, but it, but I, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but if it's not knocked, it's not likely to be an arrow. So there are only those two, and I think they're rather crudely painted. I, I personally wouldn't put, put much... Uh, emphasis on the fact that they're crooked. There are a few forked arrows around uh, um, and they look very much like those two that those two women are holding. The ones at Fech and Fluch, for example, are very much like that. Uh, because if you're, going to, if you're going to paint an arrow at a particular scale and then you're going to have to indicate that it's knocked, if you keep to scale that knock is barely visible. So you have to exaggerate the knock, and that's what I think is happening there. And we know from many paintings that they are not shy to exaggerate, leave out. This is, this is what Gombrich is talking about. This is why what he says about art and illusion. Art, he says, is, is always an illusion. This, this rock art is an illusion. It's, it's an illusion to persuade people by, by some kind of trick but not by deception rather by persuasion you know that you, what you're looking at is an arrow right so but but again this is all we got to agree on this we don't agree on it we don't agree on it if if the strongs believe that uh, they're crooked and that's important what can i say i don't happen to think that that's important but you know whatever the thing is, we, we must collect all this information by making good observation, and then we must build. You see, what Gombrich is saying is artist and viewer built up this repertoire of schemata. Our job as archaeologists is to fight our way into that system so that we can join in and understand those schemata. And, mm -hmm. and, and most rock art people do this in many ways. David Lewis Williams will tell you about bleeding from the nose or will tell you about bending at the waist or whatever. Those, he believes, and he may well be right, are the schemata that is cluing the viewer into what the artist is intending by making those paintings. So we're all doing this. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's certainly not... Um unusual you know when you do see arrow uh, paintings of arrows flying through the air or, you know in, in clusters um i've seen many sites where they they're quite quite curved and um, they're not perfectly straight made of bolt steel <laughs> um but uh yeah so, but that fork that is is exactly it's definitely exaggerated in all the paintings um so Tariq. Um, are there variations in the shapes and depictions of elephants? Um, yes. Um, uh, there are a lot of elephants. Uh, Andy and I are particularly interested in elephants, and we, we're spending a lot of time recording elephants at the moment. Um, and there is some variability. Uh, by and large, they're very accurately drawn. Um, I think there's a in <laughs> very interesting difference between paintings of animals and paintings of people. And this is not only a feature of the Southern African rock art. It's often a feature in other parts of the world. So if you look at Egyptian art, for instance, people are painted very stereotypically. It's as if there's not really a search for uh, naturalness. Uh, and it, it, uh, Gombrich talks a lot about this because it, 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 really, it really lasts right through to classical Greek um, statuary and so on. But animals are very finely and accurately depicted. So, and if you read that wonderful book by uh, Reynaud Ego, I've forgotten what it's called now, but it came out last year, wonderful book. And he, he addresses this issue of why are humans not depicted 
with the same level of uh, lifelikeness as animals are. And he talks about that, and I think he's probably right, and it has something to do with the way people are thinking about their relationship to other people and their relationship to animals um, uh, and so on. So elephants are painted pretty realistically, actually, not only individual elephants so that the proportions are pretty good, Andy would say near perfect, but it goes on to clusters of elephants, to, to, the, to the mother and, and, and calf theme, or to the collections of adult elephants of various kinds. There's a, there's a, lot, there's, there's a lot of lifelikeness, and that's consistent with what Ombrick is saying. Sometimes lifelikeness is seemingly important. Sometimes it's less important. I've just seen a couple of elephants. In fact, we went to where you were, Nick, uh, and, and E. Craig. We went up to Kleinfontein over the Pacos, and Nico, I've forgotten his surname now, but Nico, the landowner there, um, he, he, he showed us a number of sites, and we saw three elephants there. I know there are a lot more. There's that beautiful long line of elephants. Mm, beautiful sites. Mm. A couple of the elephants are very slender. They're very thin. I was very surprised to see these two. They, the proportions, if you like, the proportions of the the height to the belly compared to the height to the back, very odd. They do look like elephants. They do appear to have trunks, but they are a bit odd. The third one was, in my view, perfectly normal, you know, kind of chunky elephant. So I, I, I would... I would like to think that we can learn more about the variability of elephants. For instance, I would, l I would love to be able to tell female elephants from male elephants from the paintings. You apparently can tell them from the living animals, but I, I haven't learned to do that yet, and it would be, it would be really nice to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can tell elephant young from adults. So I'm not sure what Terry is uh, aiming for there, but we could always talk about that soon. Mm. Yeah. Um, John, we only have one more question, um, and that's uh, Mary again, just asking about whether the sticks that uh, I think it was the Drehook painting that the women were carrying in instead of arrows, well, um, instead of the men rather, that the men were perhaps carrying musical bows. Um, so, what are your yeah. thoughts on musical bows? Andy's very interested in musical bows. And he has some very interesting ideas about how you might tell a depiction of a musical bow from a hunting bow. Uh, and of course, the same object may be used for both. Um, men in the Kalahari often play on their bow uh, with the arrow they they So I, I, I don't have particular thoughts on that. I don't happen to think that those sticks that are being um, carried by the Driuk men uh, which happens in both lines, both both lines of men. Both lines have men and women in them, and in both lines at Drehook, the males and the females are distinguished physiologically and in terms of what they're carrying and uh, and and equipment and so on. I don't happen to think. Obviously, what happens is you start to recognize a pattern, and your mind starts to turn over. What am I seeing in association with this? What could this mean? Uh, I'm going to tell you something that I don't think I've ever told anybody else yet. So, and I, I think that those double sticks have to do with pastoralists. I don't know what they are, but you've just been, Stephen and Nick, up mm -hmm. to, up to um, Sheep Shelter. And at Sheep Shelter, there's at least one man carrying those two sticks. And the nearest things to him are two fat-tailed sheep. Now, that isn't the case at Drio. So we don't get an easy ride here by these <laughs> Sam people. We don't get an easy ride. It takes, it takes a lot of piecing together and matching and pattern recognition and so on. But if you ask me at the moment, I would say that those double sticks have something to do with pattern. Because it's always puzzled me that we have never been very successful at finding pastoralists in the human images. 
Why aren't they there? Surely they have to be there. Um, Royden and Tony did think that a few figures that we found might have been pastoralists, and, and they may be right. But we haven't yet discovered the schemata for that. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the. There are lots of schemata that we know nothing about yet, but and that's one of them. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree. Yeah, and the, the sort of style that those are painted um, sort of matches that. A bit of, it's a bit cruder in a way, um, uh, and that seems to come late. Those, uh, this, this, those are the I ones that's has got. Yeah, there. yeah. That's see that, that guy, see what I'm pointing at now. Well, I don't know whether you can see. That's a uh, double we, stick. We don't have your your presentation up at the moment, but um, oh. yeah, we've got the virtual turf. The middle figure uh, there on what Stephen has got there. He's carrying two. Uh, it's always in one two sticks in one hand, right next uh, to one another. Yeah. It, yes, it's that's one. It, 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 it is something, and we're going to find out what it is, but we don't know yet. At least I don't. Well, John, um, I won't keep everyone uh, all night. Uh, we've had wonderful questions from the audience, and uh, as I said, just over 60 people attended this evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, and, yeah, these are great questions. And, John, thank you very, very much for standing in at such uh, short notice. And for Stephen, um, I've shared your links to the Baboon Point uh, 3D tour and um, the links to the virtual tours that Stephen's been demonstrating. Uh, so please, everyone, check them out and enjoy them. Um, I think they're very, very interesting and worth, worth, worth visiting. Um, John, yeah, just thank you very much. And we'll definitely have to sort out a bottle of wine um, at some point. I think there's quite a backlog of, of bottles of wine owed. Um, and uh, just have a lovely evening and really appreciate this wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And, and I'm, I'm always available to talk about these things, obviously. Excellent. Right. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Bye. <laughs>